and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he puts the stud in Ristic Study, it's Matt Morgan. So Joey, do you know what the hottest letter of the alphabet is? Uh, I don't know, Z or something? I'm, I'm uh, not sure. Not even close. It's B, because it can even make oil boil. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. yeah, that is, yes, it, it absolutely is. What a very transformative letter. Well done, letter B. I, <laughs> I turned the heat up on this joke, and so I'm, I'm sorry to listeners at home if uh, it's too warm in here for you. Wow. Okay. That's that's great. All right. Up next, he puts the rhythm in Rhythm of the Wild. Actually, wait a second. He puts the wild in Rhythm of the Wild, too. It's Dana Roach. I like that second one better for sure. Um, did you hear about the guy who started fixing breakfast at midnight on December 31st? Uh, no. He wanted to make a New Year's toast. Dang it. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, wholesome, I'm not wholesome. okay. Wholesome. <laughs> oh, you guys are wordsmiths and geniuses, and I absolutely adore you both. That was great. All right, this is the EDH Rec cast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we like to do is give all of that data just a little more context. Dana, what is it that we're talking about in this week's episode? Our favorite underplayed commanders, Chapter 2, Electric. Boogaloo. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it is a kind of a, a revisitation of a topic. We haven't mentioned uh, anything about underplayed, like way underplayed commanders since, oh goodness, like June of 2021. So we've had a lot of new, I mean, let's be real, that have, there have been approximately 525,600 new legendary creatures in the interim time. So yeah, let's talk about some more of those legendary creatures that we like that have kind of slipped through the cracks that we think deserve a little bit more of the spotlight. But before we get into our main topic, we've got a couple of shout outs that we got to do. First, I'd like to thank Chase, also known as Mana Curves, for help editing the show. You can find them on Twitter at Mana Curves. EDH Rec is also streaming on Whatnot. You can follow our content manager, Jason Alt, as he does awesome stuff on those Whatnot streams, like giveaways and cool stuff like that. Follow EDH Rec on social media to learn more. And if you want to sign up to be eligible for any of those awesome fun things, you can go to whatnot.com slash invite slash EDH Rec. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by liking and subscribing the video on YouTube, subscribing on your local podcast apps, or you can go to patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, where we have patron tiers of all sorts of levels, whether you want to join the Discord community we have, whether you want to see all the historic challenge stats picks, see all the episodes a day early. There's all that and more over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, including the very special and exclusive tier where we give a shout out to a patron every single week. And this week, Ryan Leverone, thank you so much for your support. We definitely appreciate it. Um, I hope you're related to Kevin Leverone, as in like the bodybuilder because that person was <laughs> massive literally and in the in their their popularity oh but, well and you know what's also massive our appreciation for you ryan thank you matt and my dad joking correct did i do you're, it you, your <laughs> uncle joking you're getting close um, <laughs> but not quite that is fantastic also i gotta i gotta pause and address you said our exclusive tier it's literally just one dollar. One dollar patreon tier is our, is our is exclusive our to so. patreon.com slash edhretcast <laughs> So you're just trying to get the additional plugs in there as much as possible. Yeah, I'm 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 just making sure that Ryan knows that <laughs> their shout out was so exclusive they're the only one getting it this week. <laughs> That's how exclusive it is. Oh, goodness. Well, anyway, folks, thank you so, so much for the support. We really love shouting out everyone who supports the show. It is it really it warms our hearts every time that we that we get to see the people who want to put their support behind it. It's that it, it means a whole lot. But OK, we've got a show that we've got to get into now. So let's get to it. Our primary takeaway from the 2022 year in review show was basically to the effect of like the increasing product overload has led to a lot of cards getting overlooked in the format. And we talked a lot about some of the cards in the 99 on that episode. But for this episode, we want to kind of give some more of the legends a bit more of the spotlight too. not just from this past year, but there are just a whole bunch of commanders out there that since there are so many legends <laughs> out nowadays, we feel like some of them deserve a little bit more of the spotlight. So yeah, I guess we're going to just kind of get on into it. I, I suppose, actually, Dana, I'll throw this question to you first. How did you define in your head what underplayed means now that we have so many legends out there? Like, what does underplayed mean to you? 
I mean, there's a bit of a shifting scale. Like if the commander is, you know, three months old, that's going to be a different number than if it's, you know, three or four years old or something. But like, basically, I feel like it, if it's in more than, say, 12 decks, it's too popular for me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I, I felt like it, it probably should be, particularly if it's a few years old, it should be an under less than 500 decks, I would say, on average. That's what I was okay. kind of thinking in terms of underplay. Matt, is that a similar metric for you? I mean, I don't think there's a hard number that you can really say is like qualifies as underplayed because there there are so many commanders out there these days and only so many decks. It's really hard to say like a definitive number. I, I think more if it's outside the top like 10 to 15 of a certain theme that you're trying to do, then it might be underplayed because you, when you start digging into some commanders, they do some really cool things, but they're just kind of drowned out by you know, the, the, the Chu Lanes and the Corvolds of the world. <laughs> so underplayed to me, like it, it, sometimes I look at a commander and I think, you can't tell me there are 10 better elf commanders than what I'm looking at right here. That's kind of what I get to defining underplayed as, is it should be played in more for what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to look at it for. Yeah, I think it's an important thing for us to mention that underplayed can be like there are some hard lines that you can draw. And yet also there's a lot of subjectivity that goes into it as well. And yeah. it might even depend on the color combination that you're choosing. Like you can literally go 24 Golgari commanders deep before you finally find a Golgari commander that has fewer than a thousand decks to it. Like we are dealing with some huge legend overload in the format. So there's a lot of different metrics, but we've each got our own versions of what underplayed means. And hopefully that these will just be a uh, the, hopefully these will each be fun commanders that folks out there might resonate with and that you want to give a try to because that strategy is pretty interesting once you start delving into it and they've just been historically overshadowed and we want to bring them back into the light. Uh, Dana, how about we start off with you? What is one of your favorite underplayed commanders as of 2022? So my first choice here for a neat underplayed commander is Rona, Disciple of Gix from back in the Dominaria set. Um, Rona is one, a black and a blue, so three mana in Demir colors for a human artificer. She's a 2-2. Two -two. Um, when Rona enters a battlefield, you may exile target historic card from your graveyard, and you may cast non-land cards exiled with Rona. Um, she also has an ability to command four mana and tap her to exile the top card of your library to further feed that. But um, I, I think the strength of this commander, that's pretty aggressively costed three mana f f for something that lets you play things kind of from out of your graveyard. You have to exile them with her first, then you can replay them. Um, and I think if you're looking to do reanimation stuff, there's like way better commanders to do that. But I think the strength of this commander is probably to do something like make it your super friends commander or a planeswalker commander oh. in Demir colors, because those are legendary creatures and that, that counts or legendary permanents, excuse me. And that counts as a historic permanent. So any planeswalker that you either, you know, use its abilities and it goes to the graveyard naturally or somebody else hits hard enough and, and knocks it to the graveyard, you can recur it and reuse it with, with Rona. You're in colors that both have the ability to blink her, um, in blue to, to reuse that ability or to just reanimate her if she dies to, to get that trigger off again. Um, there's, you know, plenty of ways to, to, reuse that ability multiple times per turn if you want to do that to bring planeswalkers back to your hand. Her ability also works with, you know, things like the Chain Veil that you're probably going to want in that deck. And if someone blows up the Chain Veil, well, you can bring that back. Or if someone <laughs> blows up any of your proliferate artifacts that are really useful to put more counters on your Planeswalkers, like, say, Contagion Engine, you can bring that back as well. And perhaps most importantly, the art on this card is awesome. <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorite pieces, I think, for an actual commander and it should see more play for that reason alone but I, I legitimately think it's probably a useful commander that you could do something with in a way that nothing else in Demir really does and I think it definitely should see more play than the I think 215 decks it's in right now on the track yeah right off the bat you're, you're getting so specific with applications on maybe a little underpowered of a commander that I I can see why there's only, you know, 200-ish decks to the name. Sure. <laughs> um, it's, you're getting into the specifics of the specifics. And when Dana even is is trying to to nitpick something 
that's when you know, folks, this is a, a deep cut of, com- of a commander. And I think that is kind of the key for a lot of the underplayed commanders. You know, I think you're not going to find anything when you're looking down in the 200 deck range. You're not going to be like, oh, this is the perfect elf commander for me because but there's a reason no one else is playing that as the elf commander. I think you tend to have to look for something kind of obscure. But mm. if you're willing to dig in a little bit of the text, like how can, how can I think outside the box? I think that's where you find some real sleepers among these underplayed commanders for sure. Yeah, and there are a lot of very interesting planeswalkers that you could play in these colors. Mm-hmm. Like Dana, I have seen you, you have a, a, a blue black artifacts deck, and you'll drop a Tezzeret Master of the Bridge and do so much work. You'll drop a Tezzeret the Seeker or a Tezzeret Artifice Master, and you'll do so like an agonizing amount of damage <laughs> with those types of things. And here they'd be perfect. So you get the best yep. of, like you can get a whole bunch of cool artifacts to tinker around with while also preserving your planeswalkers to cast later. This is, that is very, very clever. I'm, I I feel like you've been sitting on that idea for a couple of years now, actually. <laughs> I, I have, if I didn't already have a Mono White Super Friends deck, I would have built this deck. I've, I've definitely thought about it quite a bit. So this is not one I just like mm. came up with this week in Brainstorming Underplayed Commanders. This is one I have absolutely had in the pocket for a while. All right. That is, yeah, that's fantastic. So you mentioned there, you've got like the deep cut among the deep cut. Like it's not just the historic stuff. You're going like the the demure super friend. So you're going niche within niche. Um, And that is a great way to find stuff that could be, uh, you know, an underplayed commander. I kind of want to take a a slightly different approach here for there is an established archetype, but I want to shift its colors. I think that that can be another fun way that we find a an underplayed commander, an underserved legend that could actually do a whole lot of work for you. I think I might have mentioned this commander before on the show, but I want to look at the back half of Uvilda Dean of Perfection. Specifically, I want to look at Nasari Dean of Expression, which only has 333 decks right now, but I have played against this deck a couple of times and it's a house. Nisari, Dean of Expression, is a 5-mana 4-4 four, four Efreet Shaman. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of each opponent's library until end of turn. You may cast spells from among the exiled cards, and you may spend mana as though it was mana of any color to cast those spells. And whenever you cast a spell from exile, you get a plus one, plus one counter on Nisari, Dean of Expression. Don't even... It, it doesn't even matter what Uvilda does. Like, we're, we're only here for the Nisari. That is such... A potent effect. That is a stolen strategy in the command zone. That's three cards per turn. And it gets enormous as you're just doing the thing of casting spells. Like we've seen a lot of the cast from exile get benefit rewards this year. We've seen stuff like Lelia and Prosper have gotten really popular. But Nasari is sitting there to allow you to get access to those effects in red and blue, not just in red and black like we've seen this historically. And I think that means we have a lot of untapped potential that you can do because blue loves playing with exile stuff too. And this this is a very, this has just so much potential that is neat to dig into. There's also a few build paths here with this too. Like, you know, you mentioned how you don't really have to pay attention to to the uh, Yuval I forget how you pronounce it on the other side, the Dean of Perfection. Mm-hmm. Um, you can ignore that entirely and, and play it as a is it commander and never cast the other side, but you could also play it as a mono red commander. I mean, like, or you can play with the intention of using either side, depending on like what you need more at the moment. But like, you can tweak the deck with that in mind. You can absolutely build this as an Asari deck in mono red. You could build it as an Asari deck <laughs> and have is it cards in the play in, in the deck, you know, blue cards that you'll cast that will play in with what it does with no intention of ever using the blue half. Like, I think that's one of the things with, with these two, yeah. two sided commanders, people, Looked at them like, oh, I don't know what I would do with the other side. Well, you ignore it. Like, you, you, if you don't want to do it, you could ignore it and use the color, or you could ignore the color entirely. It's up to you. <laughs> you could make a mono blue. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Jack. Sure. If, yeah. If you wanted to, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I 100% agree that so, sometimes players get decision paralysis with all the things going on with any given commander, mm. and that just, just discourages them from playing that altogether. It, with all the words that are on this one piece of cardboard, which is, I believe, uh, War and Peace only has like <laughs> 17,000 pages. This has 16,004. So it's pretty dang close. Uh, but everything going on there, you're absolutely right. There, there's, I, I could imagine players getting so worried about missing out on some value by not being able to take advantage of one side that they ignore the card altogether when one side or the other, both of them are probably good enough to be a commander just in general. So yes, I would like to see more people just enjoy this card, but yeah. sometimes decision paralysis is a thing. There are just too many words and folks get lost like I did. 
<laughs> well, and there are like a lot of the play stuff from Exile get benefit strategies that we've seen have definitely appeared in red. You know, Wild Magic mm-hmm. Sorcerer is going to give your uh, the spells that you cast from Exile. The first one each turn gets Cascade. Or we've seen how Itali can play so many cards from Exile and that will pump up this commander. Um, Passionate Archaeologist is a new background in red that says whenever you cast a spell from Exile, you'll deal damage equal to the mana. Like we're all pretty familiar with those. But blue opens up some really fun options options here like sphinx of the second sun and paradox haze are really cool with this commander so that you can get that effect multiple times because you'll get additional upkeep triggers to steal even more stuff from your opponents or you can use sage of the beyond which will reduce the cost of the spells that you cast from exile or dazzling sphinx is another way to just straight up take stuff from your opponents or personal favorite Mind's Dilation, giving you free stuff basically every turn from Exile. Like, Blue has a lot to offer the play from Exile strategy, and it's all sitting right here with Nasari waiting for people to, to discover it. And I think there's just a lot that you can sink your teeth into. Well, speaking of sinking teeth into something, um, I'm going to steal the spotlight and sink my teeth into the next pick. Ah. Um, don't, don't, don't worry about how bad that segue was. It's just going to happen. <laughs> Um, so this commander, I'm going to cheat a little bit because uh, it is a fairly new commander, but... The reason that there's less than 300 decks is uh, 240 right now, I believe, is Titanian Nature's Force. And the only reason it's not more popular, I would gander, is because it's so dang impossible to open this card in a pack. <laughs> I don't even know how you get it from a pack. And that just means, in general, there's not going to be very many of these up in the wild, which means people can't really buy them from their shops. And so, yeah, it just kind of puts a, a cap on how many decks can be built but titania's nature's force is in the new brothers war commander set kind of it's not in the precons <laughs> you can only open it in collector boosters something but for green green you may play a force from your graveyard right there that's pretty good uh whenever a force enters the battlefield under your control you create a 5-3 green elemental creature token and whenever an elemental you control dies you mill three cards so right there this just got an amazing land package there uh obviously you're going to put this into your omnath locus of rage decks and your your omnath locus of whatever (laughs) but at the commander this is already pretty good joy i know you have the other titania the other mono green commander this does so much that i there it's uh, one thing you're going to notice as a theme of the commanders that i like to talk about this episode is They do a lot of great utility things. Nothing is outstanding, but they do so much of of a bunch of little things that there's a lot of value to be had by putting these cards in the command zone. And I absolutely think that Titanian Nature's Force is one of them. Uh, It's so young. It's so young of a card. There's no way it's going to stay this unpopular for long. People are finally going to start seeing it in the wild. People are definitely going to build this, but. For now, there's less than 300 decks out there, so I'm going to pick this one this week uh, because I think it's a fantastic commander for one, and then just, yeah, it's it's going to be built more. Well, he, here's the thing. Like, I this, you you mentioned I have Titania Protector of Argoth uh, as one of my, my decks, and so this new Titania is, in a lot of ways, competing against the old Titania. Like, there's a big comparison to be had there. The older one who, when your lands die, you get 5-3 elementals. And that one is probably a bit more established in the field. This is also, though, competing against a bunch of landfall decks that are very famous, very classic. So there's a big competition it entering onto the scene. Mm -hmm. But Matt, there's another version of Titania that was printed in the Brothers War proper set. uh, Titania Voice of Gaia, which is a meld half which turns into Titania Gaia Incarnate when you meld it with a land. And that one has uh, 367 decks to its name right now. So in addition to the fact that there were approximately 30 legends that came out in the Brothers War and the Brothers War Commander set, there was another version of Titania that is getting more attention than the Titania that you just mentioned. So this thing is up against a whole host of commanders from the Brothers War set. It is up against two other versions of itself, and it's up against basically all of the landfall decks that are already out there and all of the elemental tribal decks that are out there too. Like, this thing's got a lot of competition that it is up against right now. So I think that this will probably stay as underplayed just by dint of comparison alone. I mean, you're saying there's a lot of landfall decks. We, we say that about pretty much every Simic commander these days, and every Simic commander still finds a way to have 5,000 decks. So color me jaded. I think Joey's right in that I understand why there's a lot of competition for this card to be played. But I also agree with Matt. It's a great commander that should see more play for sure. 
So like I, I I get the logic about why it's not being played very heavily so far and probably won't ever get played very heavily. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be, right? Like I think it's a super cool commander that does a lot of really neat things. And if you like playing that particular deck, if, if that looks like an interesting playstyle to you, but one of your friends or, or somebody in your LGS or whatever is playing one of the other Titanias <laughs> that plays a little bit similarly, well, this this lets you still play the playstyle without feeling like you're playing a clone of that same deck. You can play something kind of similar, run a few of the same cards, but maybe not everything, and still get that same feeling just playing a different commander, which I think is a really useful thing to have an option to do as well. Well, then you just turn into that meme of, all the Spider Man's right, right. Yeah, it's <laughs> all Titania's. It's like, no, I'm Titania. No, I no, I'm Titania. <laughs> I, I think we should absolutely do that. We should on our next stream, we should have a Titania off. <laughs> the Titania. I I'm in. Yeah. Tune in at twitch.tv slash idiot treadcast for the Titania <laughs> like, showdown. There you, you now now you're getting the hang <laughs> of it, Joey. It. There it is. <laughs> My next underplayed commander here is from way back in Theros Beyond Death, which was, you know, twenty twenty one. But it was 12 sets ago, which once upon a time would have been like five years. <laughs> yeah. um, it, so it seems like it was way further back than it actually was. But it's only in 228 decks. And Plukonos Unchained is four mana. Um, it's a zombie Hydra. It comes into play with six plus one counters on it. And it escapes with 12 plus one counters on it. So Ooh. if you're casting it from your command zone, it's a six six for four mana. And if you're casting it from your graveyard with the um, escape clause, it's a 12-12. Um, it has a clause if damage would be dealt to it while it has plus one counters on it, you prevent that damage and remove that many plus one counters from it. But that's not really why I think it's, it's cool. What I would do with this commander is just play it as a plus one counters Voltron commander. Mm. I think it's not a thing that you're really seeing in Golgari colors. You're in colors that have access to a bunch of really busted effects that interact with plus one counters, whether it's doubling season or you have things like solidarity of heroes or visions of dominance that like let you just double the counters as a as a one-off effect <laughs> um you know pair it with a sack outlet and an ozolith and you can sacrifice it move the counters with the ozolith bring it back into play with the the escape clause move those counters that you just took off it back onto it um there's a ton of ways to give things trample in green it doesn't have trample built into it but like hey throw a berserk onto it and <laughs> it's a i think it would be a really cool like variant of a voltron commander in colors that don't really do that that interact with plus one counters and I, it's something that nothing else would really do and I, I would like to see that see more play that's how i would build it yeah golgari's had a lot of really cool plus one plus one synergies but sometimes it just gets overlooked or maybe pushed to the side by simic and and selesnia kind of doing the exact same thing so i like having Golgari Golgari, because you've you've seen Varol's a Scar Strike. Mm -hmm. You've mm -hmm. seen other plus one plus one commanders in Golgari colors, but I really really do like Pelucranos. I have it in my Ukima and Kazer plus one plus one counters deck, mm. and it always does an, a, just a, a load of work. I love it. It's such a good card, and I'm honestly kind of surprised that more people haven't latched onto that idea. Dana, literally all the stuff that you were describing there was reminding me of my Rehan and Ishai deck. And like I had to branch into four sure. colors to achieve some of the stuff that you were talking about. But the whole mission of that deck is exactly what you were talking about. Just like make a huge creature, pile the plus one counters into something useful, maybe Voltron someone down with commander damage or use amazing like the, the plus one counter doublers to just like go completely wild. And it, especially since you're in black, you've also got access to some cards like uh, Essence Harvest, for example. So if you did in fact, make a huge Pelucranos that, you know, doubled all of the counters with the Corpse Jack Menace or whatever. You can cast an Essence Harvest and then drain an opponent equal to the power of your huge commander, which could be up to like 24 just by having cast it because you got a bunch of token doublers. Like, excuse me, not token doublers, plus one counter doublers. Like, yeah, that's a... Uh, that's really cool. That's really efficient. I, I, if I saw this one in the command zone against me, I would be pretty worried actually, because now that you've actually described the things that this stuff can do, that's alarmingly efficient. And this is another one that I've, that I've kind of like to, to be honest, have thought about building before. Like I'm not, I get it. I just go through a list. I've, I've been eyeballing this in the past. Like, I wonder if I could. So yeah, this is again, one I've been thinking about before and I don't think I'll build it because I do have a Slesnia deck that's doing a lot of similar things mm -hmm. um, currently with my Dramuk with the Eternal deck, which I believe is one we talked about as a commander the last time we did underplayed commanders. And I took oh, my advice there and built a deck. Yeah. 
Well, th- I mean, that's funny. I, I think in that episode, we also mentioned Martin Stromgold, and that's one that I ended up building. So we need to rename these episodes, not to our favorite underplayed commanders, but like, here's what the deck building forecast looks like for us in the future. This is actually <laughs> right. a future site. <laughs> commanders, we might eventually get around to building. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, that's fun stuff. But hey, uh, well, we've got a couple of other fun underplayed commanders that we want to get into with other strategies to dive into as well we do also want to take a brief pause for challenge the stats too because there's so much data on eda track but we don't always agree with all that data sometimes we think that cards are over or underplayed so let's take a quick break and come back with some challenges well i'm going to get us started here with my pick this week and my pick is a case of if you want one you probably want another so growth spiral is already played in almost 92,000 decks which is a significant amount of decks and if you want a second copy of that effect people seem to be sleeping on joint exploration from dominaria united so it's only being played in 2600 decks so far and for one and a blue you get an instant that has kicker of a green and you, the card just says scry two then draw a card if the spell was kicked you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield so this is just kind of an upgraded and, and beefier version of growth spiral where growth spiral is just draw a card and then you can put a land from your hand on the battlefield at instant speed So only having to pay one more mana to get a scry two out of it, that just seems like a very easy, not quite upgrade, but like I said, if you want growth spiral, you probably want joint exploration. If you want joint exploration, you probably want a a growth spiral as well. So, so many decks just seem to be sleeping and forgetting that joint exploration exists so far. It is from a fairly recent set, but growth spiral exploded. It literally Mm -hmm. grew on people with how popular it was. (laughs) And so it's kind of surprising people haven't explored any additional options with joint exploration. So I expect this card eventually to latch on. Uh, this seems like the type of card that people are going to see in a pre-con and then buy five more copies for their Simic decks. But for now, it's just not getting near as much love. And it's just a simple, easy little addition that is just going to give you so much more consistency. You're going to be able to find land drops and get them into speed at instant speed. So if you have any landfall triggers you like playing, uh, maybe get some surprise blockers or anything like that. It's just a fantastic addition. It's another copy of Growth Spiral. Uh, and it's already, it, we have the, the base level, which is 92,000 decks for Growth Spiral. I'm not saying all 92,000 decks want another copy, but... I would guess at least half do. And that's a significant amount of decks for joint exploration to find its way into. So if you like Growth Spiral, you want another copy, explore your way onto the the joint exploration (laughs) card because that's just a great, great addition. Dad jokes in the challenge to stats. Matt, you are killing me. I mean, you you could join me in this and it could be a joint dad joke. Stop. Okay, no, we're moving. I'm going to move to our listener (laughs) challenge. Let's do this together, Joey. Come on. (laughs) We're going to move to our listener challenge this week. Fine. Uh, this comes to us from Chad Haverkamp, who has a great challenge for a card that is currently a little bit overplayed in Muldrotha the Gravetide deck. Specifically, there's a rules non-bow that Chad, it, this is a really great thing to, to dig into to make sure that Muldrotha players are being as wise as possible about the cards that they play in their decks. Specifically, the card that is named here is Canoptic Tomb Sentinel, which is a recent card from the Warhammer 40k set. And about 511 Muldrotha decks have been built since this uh, since the Warhammer set released, and about 20% of those are running Canoptic Tomb Sentinel. And that's going to be too much because there is a rules non here that Chad points out. So Canoptic Tomb Sentinel is a 4-mana artifact creature insect. It has a uh, It is vigilant. It is a 4-3. And it has this ability, Exile Cannon. When Canoptic Tomb Sentinel enters the battlefield from a graveyard, exile up to one target non-land permanent. So nothing when you cast it normally, but it has an unearth ability. That unearth ability is generally where you would get the actual exile cannon effect to exile a target non-land permanent. The idea that looks to be happening here is that Muldrotha players expect that you can cast this as, say, your artifact for the turn with Muldrotha's effects. You can cast it from your graveyard and then you would be able to exile target non-land permanent. The problem that Chad points out is that when you are casting that, it doesn't enter from the graveyard. 
it enters from the stack. So you don't actually get that effect for the Tomb Sentinel to exile anything at all. So the 20% of the recent Muldrotha decks that are playing this one so far, maybe reconsider. Thank you so much for pointing out this rules non-bow. We appreciate listener challenge the stats so much, especially when they help us get better about these types of tricky rules interactions. So thank you for that. And now let's move on to our final challenge. The final challenge we have here comes from way back in Tempest. Um, it's a sorcery named Ledger Domain, two and a two blue. Um, it says exchange control of target artifact or a creature with another target permanent that shares one of those types with it. And this effect just lasts indefinitely. It's not like a control magic effect where if someone removes it, they can get control of their creature back. You're just swapping the worst thing you control for the best thing they control or the worst thing one of your opponents controls for the best thing one of your other opponents controls, if there's a logical <laughs> reason to do that as well. You don't got to do it to yourself necessarily. Um, role reversal from War of the Spark is in 5,000 decks. This is in only about 1,500. Um, but role reversal requires you to be in Izzet colors. So it's a very, very good card because you can exchange control of any permanence. You can swap a Planeswalker for a Planeswalker, an enchantment for an enchantment, whatever. Um, but you have to have access to both those colors. Not every deck does. And I, I think Legend of Man should see more play, particularly in decks where you're making tokens, especially small tokens. Things like Talran, Sky Summoner, for example, is where I run it. Mm. I will gladly exchange control of a Drake I already attacked with that's now tapped for whatever the biggest thing you have is, while also making myself a replacement Drake because it's a sorcery spell. Things like Marnius Kalgar from the most recent uh, Warhammer set makes a Star of Warrior tokens. You can swap out one of those those two two warrior tokens for again some big awful beater that you don't want to deal with. Well, why remove it when you can just take it? <laughs> Legend of Man, I think, is a really, really solid card in, in the right deck and should definitely see more play if you are making tokens and you have access to blue and, and, and either want a second copy of Roll Reversal or just don't have access to red so you can't run Roll Reversal. Why remove it when you can just take it? Absolutely. This is another one of those cards, though, that it was only printed back in Tempest. So right. nobody yeah. except for Dana knows this card exists. <laughs> You know what it reminds me of a little bit, uh, Matt, I think it was you who challenged on a, a show a little bit ago, several episodes back, Cultural Exchange, which also mm -hmm. allows you to gain control of other people's stuff by exchanging Wii tokens and things like that. And I, I'm just going to need both of you guys to stop um, playing blue stuff that's going to steal my things. I want to play my thing. Stop stealing my stuff, you guys. Don't, don't run good stuff and I won't try to take it. <laughs> problem problem that's, solved that's exactly it <laughs> they won't take your stuff if your stuff isn't worth <laughs> taking all right that's the so i i came into that i was playing another card game with some friends this weekend i was playing here to slay which there's a card in there that's basically ledger main but it's repeatable and it's absolutely right if you don't have anything worth stealing people aren't going to steal your stuff <laughs> so yes I, that that applies to just any card game in general not just magic <laughs> I suppose. Wow, that is so, so silly. Okay, let's <laughs> let's get back into our main topic here. I will take the lead on this next underplayed commander that I, I hope gets to see a little bit more love. This one is Inquisitor Eisenhorn from the Warhammer deck. So it's very, very recent, 84 decks to its name at the current moment. But specifically, the reason that I think this one isn't going to budge too much more uh, highly, even though it is recent, is that it's currently in 19th place of the 24 Warhammer legends that are available. A lot of the other legends have been able to, to sort of take people's attention here. Specifically, this is a blue-black commander that, like, I don't care about any of the other words on it. The thing that I care about is that it says whenever it hits an opponent, it investigates equal to the amount of damage that it has done. Like, it will create a number of clue tokens equal to the damage that it does to another person. Blah. That's amazing. That is just so, so cool. That's so many clues. That can be so many clues. This is feels to me like a, a, a clever artifact Voltron-y deck just waiting to happen. And I, I really hope it gets to have above uh, 100 decks, above 300, above 500. Like, this actually strikes me as being incredibly good. If you stick a cranial plating or a nettle cyst in there, all those clues suddenly pump up the commander even more. This is a machine. This thing seems so, so good. Yeah, you that was, as soon as I was reading it, I'm like, oh, Nettle Sis would be great in here. So would Cranial Plating. And then like three <laughs> seconds later, Joey's like, run a Nettle Sis or a Cranial Plating. Yeah, actually, this is a card I, I don't, I, I think I, I read, but it didn't entirely register in my brain what exactly it did. Because <laughs> absolutely, that 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 will get stronger every turn in the right kind of deck. Yeah. That's a, that is very, very cool. I like that commander a lot. That's a good, that's a good pick. 
I wonder if like the first paragraph on it kind of buries the most important. So it, this is the four mana Demir two, three. You may reveal the first card you draw each turn as you draw it. Whenever you reveal an instant or sorcery card this way, you create a legendary four, four black demon creature token with flying. And it's named something that I, uh, Cherubail, I can't pronounce that. But like, th- there's like four lines of text in front of the most important stuff on this card. And I think that is what is burying it a little bit because the most important stuff that it can do making so many clue tokens is like not until you get down near the last part of the card. And I I just really think that this is a very potent effect. It's, it's very potent for sure. Yeah. Just not just the, the ability on the text, but like you said, Joey, there's approximately 1700, different commanders in Warhammer 40k precons. So this is just, (laughs) it's, oh, there's so many good designs that are just buried so far down that it's really hard. You, it stinks that you have to kind of do your own homework to find a, a powerful commander that other people are doing. Not that they're not powerful, but just they're, they're so far down all these lists. Can you, can you imagine, I'm just like, can you imagine you hit someone with this and you'll investigate twice, but oops, you have a, an academy manufacturer in place. So you actually get two clues, two food and two treasure each turn. Like I, oh, that's, that's going to be awesome. Or we mentioned some Demir Planeswalkers earlier, Tezzeret Master of the Bridge. Like that one pluses and you deal damage to your opponents equal to the number of artifacts you have. Well, Inquisitor Eisenhorn is going to make a whole bunch of artifacts. Or like Dana, a favorite of yours is Shimmer Dragon. Tap all of those things so that they yeah. can be, they can mm-hmm. draw a bunch of cards. I really feel like this has so much potential just, just waiting there. This is a fantastic clue commander. I, I'm already trying, trying to think if I want to try to brew this now. You've convinced hey, me, hey. Joe. You've convinced me to maybe give it a go. Yes. Wait, don't you already have a blue black artifacts deck? Are you gonna double dip? Three, I think. <laughs> what's what's one more? You have three? Not not artifact decks, just blue black decks. But like what's a one out of four thing went into the party? It'll be a good time. Dana, like all of us, has a type. Yeah, no, and I've I've got a whole bunch of Golgari stuff that I tinker around with too. So yeah, I I, I might build that Pelucanus one that he mentioned earlier. <laughs> so like let's be honest with ourselves. All right, Matt, let's throw it to you. So another one of mine, it's it's one of those commanders that I mentioned earlier that you look down the list and you're like, I, you can't tell me there's 10 other commanders that are better at this thing than this one commander. Um, so I, the next one I want to talk about is General Kudro of Dranith. It's it's one in Orzov colors for a legendary human soldier. It says other humans you control get plus one, plus one. Uh, whenever General Kudro of Dranith or another human enters the battlefield under your control, you exile target card from an opponent's graveyard. You're welcome, Joey. Hey. And also you can pay two mana and sacrifice two humans. Also, you're welcome, Joey, to destroy target creature with power four or greater. So you've got a lot going on here that it's kind of like what I mentioned with Titanium Nature's Force. Nothing, not one ability is going to blow you away with how powerful or efficient it is. But it's doing so many things that are always going to be useful. You have built-in Grave Hate. You have Removal. You have an Anthem for all the tokens or whatever you want to be making. Mm. I just, I like all the things that are going on here. They don't stand out, but there's so much utility. I really love commanders like this that there's you have so many little things going on that they're just a very, very useful. And there's not really a time you don't want to see this card, whether you're playing it in the 99 or in your command zone. It's kind of like, uh, to me, it feels like Tristani Discordant type of commander. Yeah. There, it's, it, there's not a lot of wow factor to it, but there's a lot of nice things that you want that you're always going to have relevant in a game. And it's just it's just a fantastic commander. And so I see that there's only 350 General Kudro decks out there. And I just wonder, like, what did people just not care? Was Ikoria, was it such a complicated and crowded set that everybody just forgot this card existed? I, I just, I can't figure it out. I think it's just a great utility card. There's a lot going on, just so many small abilities that's never going to be irrelevant. And I just, to me, that seems like a recipe for a great commander. One of the things that I think buries this the most is the fact that this can show up in other mm-hmm. human decks like Jarena Kudro or Trin and Silvar. Oh, absolutely. And that is a thing that I, I'm pretty sure you noted it earlier, but it's worth repeating here again, is that we feel like we want to get as much value out of a thing as possible. Like, I think this came up when we were talking about, like, maybe just play a mono red Nasari. That could also totally work. And we, as commander mm-hmm. players, sometimes feel like we'd be leaving value on the table if we didn't expand into all of the options. But I, I love the comparison that you made to Tristani Discordant. And for a while, uh, so you've just moved your Selesnia deck into Tristani Discordant. I did. And for a while, it was also a Yasharn deck. Mm -hmm. And that thing too, like you look at it, you read it, and it's not blowing you away. But holy crap, it was putting in so much work for you. And so does Tristani. Again, it's not the kind of thing that is like 
oh yeah, this really like screams like you must build me. But the amount of utility, like it's got so many words on that, especially this Kudro example here. There are so many words here. This is a very finely tuned card that is doing a lot of the things that you want once you're actually in a game, even if at first blush, when you first read it, it doesn't blow you away the way that some other commanders that have access to more colors might be more dazzling at first glance. And I think that's the biggest strike against it too, like you said, Joey, only being two colors, that's probably what people generally, people just like playing more colors because they have access to more cards and more options. One thing I think that that kind of hurts them, but maybe shouldn't too, is like primarily we've been talking about commanders that are very much asking you to build around the commander. And if the commander isn't in play, the deck probably isn't going to function as well as it as it normally would. And mm. there's advantages to that, but there's also disadvantages. If commander's stolen, if it gets killed too many times, your deck works less effectively. It, that's where commanders like General Kudro come in. If you are building a, a human deck like this, it doesn't need General Kudro to function. It's just a piece that adds extra utility to the deck when it's already working. Right. And there are downsides to that. Maybe it's not as powerful, but there are upsides too in that your deck functions just fine if you don't cast your commander or someone kills it three times and you don't have the mana to cast it again. There's plenty of upsides to that as well. And I think people prefer to go the splashier route and go with the commander that's a real important part of how your deck functions versus something like this where if you don't cast it, your deck's going to work just fine. Yeah, I, I definitely fall into that pit tr- or the the pitfall, I guess you would say, <laughs> of my my deck does absolutely diddly without my <laughs> commander in play. I have... Probably of, of all my decks, I probably have like three, I would say, that can do okay without the commander in play. But that's also, that's just how I build my decks, though. Mm-hmm. I, I I play commander because I want to do the one thing, and I look at a commander, and I say, okay, I want to do this thing. And so, yes, it, it does feel kind of weird saying people should play this more generically powerful commander because that's kind of the exact opposite of what I do when I build decks. Uh, so my last commander here I have is is actually relatively new. It's from Dominar United. And it's it's one of the box topper commanders, and I think it's one we t- actually talked about a little bit when we talked about a few of those box toppers. And that's General Marhalt Elves Dragon. Mm. Um, there's currently only 250 decks in EDH rec, um, and there's a lot of competition. If you want to play creature stompy stuff in in Gruul, which is what this commander's in two and a red and a green for a four four he's an elf warrior um whenever a creature you control becomes blocked it gets plus three plus three till end of turn for each creature blocking it and we talked about this a little bit and how like oh you can you know use a bunch of lure effects i do think that's the reason people should be playing this commander i think there's nothing else out there that's going to demand that you build a deck built around forcing people to block your creature. <laughs> and I think like that's a really cool effect, though, if you can yeah. find yourself in that position where, hey, someone's got a bunch of creatures over there and you're going to make them all block whatever creature you want to attach your stuff to. Everything else will get through. The thing that is being blocked will then get ginormous and hopefully trample damage over the top as well as killing all of their stuff in the process. I think that's a really neat niche commander that, again, nothing else is really duplicating. There's nothing else that you can really say, I want to run like eight different ways to give my creatures a lure. <laughs> that's, that, right, right. And have that be like an effective strategy that you're going to build your entire deck around. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a strange, unique thing that will look different than every other deck at the table. And I think it just should see more play for that reason. Oh man, could you imagine this with like that, what is that one mana taunting elf, zero yeah. one all creatures able yeah. to block taunting elf have to do so. And then you've got this in place. So you attack the token player, Mr. Matt Morgan over there. It's just like, all right, cool. My zero one taunting elf is now a 300 slash 301 taunting elf. And also your entire board is gone. This is, I, I am I am very surprised actually that this one doesn't have more to its name because there's a lot of unique stuff on offer here. And, and you have cards in green like Benefactor's Draft that let you untap every creature. So like people can't <laughs> even get away with it by tapping all their creatures down. You can untap all of their stuff when you force them to block. Oh, yeah, I just, oh, what? It, it's, it's a, it, it could be a super fun commander, I think, um, if you're willing to think outside the box and it, it yeah, I, I would like to see this, this show up at tables more often. I mean, I remember when we talked about just all the the commander or not the commander legends, but the the Dominary legends, revisited legends, electric boogaloo legends, whatever it was <laughs> that we called it. But but yeah, we we both of us, Danny, you and I, we were very excited about the things that you can be doing with this commander. 
just seeing the character come back and all that. So yeah, it, mm-hmm. it is kind of, well, granted there was a lot of these commanders that were kind of revisited. Yes, sure. So yeah, this one definitely was kind of caught up in the wash, but I do love what it's still going on still. And yeah, it's just a, it's a fun commander. Yeah, that that is really cool. It gets the nostalgia points for it as well. This is mm-hmm. this would lead to a fun time up until the moment that you've uh, used that taunting elf to kill my entire board. Right. And I'm just like, well, <laughs> right. what do I do now? Well, I suppose I just get trampled over by the rest of the red green onslaught that is sure to come my way the very next turn. That is a. Uh, that's really cool. Um, I'll go from that red green and move back into. I have a final blue black example here that I want to bring up. It is Vohar Vodalian Desecrator, also a commander from this year from the uh, Dominaria set. I think that we got this year, and it is a little Merfolk looter type of effect right there in your command zone. And I think that's important for a couple of reasons. So it is a uh, blue and a black, a two mana Phyrexian a Merfolk Wizard, a one two. It can tap to draw a card, then discard a card. If you discarded an instant or sorcery card this way, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life and also you can pay to and sacrifice vohar to cast target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard this turn and then if it would be put back if that uh spell would be put into your graveyard from there instead it will be exiled you can only use that effect as a sorcery speed effect um this probably looks a little nondescript but uh, matt i don't know you've played some of the older formats could you, you know, share with the class the best use of those merfolk looter effects and and what might be useful to get into the graveyards when you're discarding stuff from your hand? Any ideas, bud? Uh, I, there's reanimation. <laughs> there's reanimation. There's, Gold star. There's casting spells from your graveyard. <laughs> I hate that you make me do this. This is embarrassing. <laughs> Come on, dad. You are a dad. You embarrass me in public. You, you, you got the job. I've, I've, we've moved. We've evolved from dad jokes to dad <laughs> <laughs> embarrassing. And there we've got. Oh man, this is a two mana looter in the command zone, and it can also flash back one of your spells. That is a just such an efficient recipe for a Demir reanimator commander. So you can use this turn two. You play it turn three. You tap draw a card, discard like an Archon of Cruelty or a Sheoldred or a Triplicate Titan and then reanimate it with an Animate Dead or the spell Reanimate or a Necromancy or use Ever After as another one, Dance of the Dead, Persist. There are so many amazing things that you can do here and I just love this as an option, another option for Demir Reanimator. We've seen Reanimator in a bunch of different forms but this fills a very specific purpose for Reanimator decks that is sometimes very difficult to actually get going like i play a lot of reanimator and sometimes getting stuff into the graveyard in the first place is a difficult hurdle and this commander just aces that quiz it does such a good job of getting stuff into your graveyard in the first place and it filters your hand and it can flash back your reanimation spells if you need it to this this has a a, just gold star i just this has winner all over it i really think this one should get another look that's a, yeah, and the fact that it's two mana makes a is a big yeah. deal too. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that a two mana commander that loots it isn't just being played just out of for value reasons in, in Demir <laughs> colors. That's really really useful. And and again, I think it's because it has that like oh, if you discard instants and sorceries, you get extra effects. So that takes the attention. But who cares about that part? You don't need that right. part. You can just discard the big creatures. Discard an ancient silver dragon or an ancient brass dragon. Reanimate it next turn and go to town. Oh, man, talk about decks that we might build in the future. I oh, <laughs> mm, just mm, I'm just in love. All right. I could I could probably spend the rest of the podcast talking about this one, but we won't. We won't. Matt, you've got one final example. Take the floor. Well, my, my one final example is kind of a culmination of everything that we've seen over the past few years of just getting a whole bunch of different commanders, different legendary permanents and legendary creatures and all that stuff. So my pick is going to be Empress Galena. So there's only 250 (laughs) decks for Empress Galena. And Joey, your challenge talked about stealing people's stuff. So why not put that effect into the command zone? So as commanders get more and more powerful, Empress Galena decks get more and more powerful just by nature of stealing their commanders. Now, granted, people don't always love it when you steal their commanders. Mm. We've talked about this many times, but... Because 80% of the creatures in the 99 are legendary creatures these days. <laughs> you get to steal pretty much whatever. But also, it does say a legendary permanent. It does not have to be, as Dana pointed out with his uh, challenge stats a few weeks ago, read the fine text. It's not just legendary creatures. If you want to steal somebody's um, guy's cradle, 
Cool. <laughs> you want to steal a planeswalker? Cool. You can steal any legendary permanent for the low, low mana cost of two blue and tapping Empress Galena. So if you have ways to untap your creatures, you can do this multiple times a turn. So it's any legendary permanent, and we've gotten so many legendary permanents, whether it's artifacts, um, you have all these legendary creatures and lands and just everything going on. You can just steal a format full of <laughs> targets. This is just great. So every time we get a new set, you get 60 new targets for Empress Galena. That's just great. That's wonderful. So Empress Galena just, it's forgotten about. It hasn't been printed since Invasion, but also it just gets better literally with every set. So Matt, I know that you were being facetious when you were like, these days, 80% of creatures and decks are legendary. I know that that was just like an exaggeration, but like we have absolutely was done it really? episodes. <laughs> right, that's right, we've right. done episodes in the past where we have noted the number of legendary permanents and decks keeps going up and up each year. So like, yeah, this is getting more powerful, but also, but also Matthew, what you? I want to break your brain here real quick. No. You're talking about stealing legendary stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know the card ley line of singularity? I do. I do. If Leyland of Singularity is in your opening hand, you can be in the game with it and play, yada yada. Uh, it also is an enchantment that says all non-land permanents are legendary. So Empress Galena can just take anything? 77% of Empress Galena decks are already onto that idea. They're hip to your jib, Joseph. <laughs> um, so, so good job, 77% of deck builders. 33% uh, get with the times. Oh man, this this would be a very terrifying deck to go up against. Only 255 so far on EDH rec. And um, uh, Matt, if this goes up, it's your fault. I literally said during Challenge of Stats, stop taking my stuff. And what do you do? I, so I'm, I'm taking your stuff. I'm exiling your graveyards. I'm doing everything that you hate, which means I'm probably on the right track. <laughs> Yeah, and this is a card, you know, we talked recently about um, the, the effect of reprints on prices, too. Like, this was a relatively expensive card for a long time because the only printing was an invasion. Um, but there's a list printing now and a secret layer printing of it. So it's, I think the list first is under $5. So this this also can be had hmm. for a pretty um, reasonable price compared to what it once was. Yeah. All right. That's that's definitely good to note. Um, again, though, Dana, I'm going to have to uh, request stop encouraging people to take my stuff. What did I just say? OK, fair. That's fair. Dang. Well, those were really cool explorations. I'm I'm way into a lot of these. I can see why they are some of our favorite underplayed uh, commanders. But I guess before we actually close this episode out, uh, fellas, do we have any other final thoughts that we want to share about these underplayed gems of legends? Uh, maybe not about these ones, but I, I think in general, I mean, we were all talking about how we're thinking about building these and taking ideas from one another. I would love to hear from our listeners about some underplayed commanders they think should see more play and maybe specifically why. Like, don't just say this is a cool commander. Tell us, like, how you would build it, what you think a, an interesting, unique brew path would be. Um, cause I'm, I'm always listening and open to new ideas. And I think all of us are. And, and maybe it's a way to get your ideas out there to other listeners. So feel free to tweet at us or, or send us a message somewhere about what you think, you know, would, would be a cool underplayed commander. Respond in the comments of the YouTube video down below. Um, whatever is best for you but yeah i'd like to hear some of these some of these ideas back from listeners yeah that's a, a really great idea it'll be yeah there's there's just again as we said there are so many legends out there these days it's nice for some of these to get a little bit more time in the spotlight because there just are so many mm. legendary creatures every single set mm -hmm. and a lot of them are bangers and we just don't all have the ability to pay attention to every single one but again when we stop and we pause and we comb through a lot of these we find some terrific abilities including matt's ability to steal my stuff which i'm gonna ask him one final time to stop doing but i understand and i'm gonna tell you one final time no <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when we let the selesnia player start playing blue it's um it's a problem for me but we, we be. become the things that we hate <laughs> dogs and cats living together mass hysteria mass hysteria Oh, man. All right. But yeah, like Dana said, listeners, we would love to hear from you about your favorite underplayed commanders, especially any recent ones that have come out within this past year. What things do you think aren't getting enough of the limelight but totally deserve it? With that, though, we'll call the episode to a close. So, fellas, if our listeners want to get in touch with us, where is it they can find us all? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash EDHRecCast every Wednesday evening. We have guests on every single week. It's a super fun time, so make sure you tune in for all of that as well. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter, but it's at Dana Roach. You can hear me on my other podcast, CMDR Central, and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDHRecCast. 
And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz, and you can find the cast at EDH Retcast on Facebook and Twitter. Plus, if you have a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRetcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. 